Good morning. In today's scripture text, forerunners and messengers advance the advent of our God. While John the Baptizer's voice in the wilderness may be the principal focus of the day, Malachi's prophecy could as easily herald the coming Lord Jesus as forerunner of the Lord of hosts. And finally, all the baptized are called to participate in the sharing of the gospel. In so doing, we prepare the way for the coming of the Lord and assist all flesh in capturing a vision of the salvation of God. We are gathered for worship this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we are gathered for worship the second Sunday of Advent. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The glory of our Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We approach God's throne of grace with repentant hearts. Faithful God, as we prepare our hearts for the coming of your Son, we confess that we have been unfaithful to you. Forgive our sins, cleanse our hearts, and keep us faithful for the promised coming of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God is patient, not wanting any to perish, but to come to repentance. He sent his Son, the babe of Bethlehem, to show his infinite love and forgiveness for all. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Christ who came and who will come again. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of, of the Holy Spirit be with you all. O Lord, have mercy and come to us. Come, Lord Jesus. O wisdom proceeding from the mouth of the Most High, pervading and permeating all creation, come and teach us the way of prudence. O Adonai, and ruler of the house of Israel, who appeared to Moses in the burning bush and gave him the law on Sinai, come with an outstretched arm and redeem us. O Root of Jesse, standing as a sign before the peoples, before whom all kings are mute, to whom the nations will do homage, come quickly to deliver us. O Emmanuel, our King and our Lawgiver, the Anointed of the Nations and their Savior, come and save us, O Lord our God. Let us pray. Store up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, give to all the people of the world knowledge of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for this day is from the third chapter of the prophet Malachi. The prophet writes, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you will seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Here ends the reading. Our psalmody for this day comes from the first chapter of Luke. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel, you have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. 
Through your holy prophets, you promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us, to show mercy to our forebears, and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Our dialogue for lighting the second candle, the candle of peace, Come and gather, O people of God, let us gather at the house of the Lord. We await the word who will lead all nations. We await the one who will guide us in peace. Let us in peace kindle the light of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, for this season we are grateful. Wake us up, we pray, in the midst of the busyness of this season. Help us to hear your voice, sense your presence, worship you, and serve you in both word and deed. This we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today we are two Sundays into the season of Advent. And we know that in this season that we are to look towards the one who is coming into being, the one who came, who comes, and who will come again. Now last week as we embarked on our Advent journey, we lit the first candle and in the biblical passages appointed, we were propelled into the future to consider the end of time. Well, today our readings send us in the opposite direction. Today we're pulled into the history of the distant past to hear the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepared the way of the Lord. It seems to me that if we read the passage closely, that there's an audacity to today's gospel reading that, that may be easy to miss, but if you listen closely and if you read just a bit between the lines, then you'll hear a promise that at first, though it may be easy to overlook, is ultimately as transformative as it is outrageous. 
And it all starts with Luke's penchant for situating his narrative amid the historical figures of his day. It was the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias ruler of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, that the word of God came to John son of Zechariah in the wilderness. You see, Luke is placing the beginning of the Christian story, a story that now defines, encourages, and challenges his, this community of faith. He's placing it into the history of the world. Now we've heard this list of characters so often, and they lived so long ago that we probably don't realize how it must have sounded when read aloud so many centuries ago because these weren't just any innocuous historical figures. These rather were the very people that represented all of the might, the tradition, the power, and the threat of the Roman Empire. These were the people who enforced the status quo, and one by one, they all stood in the way of liberation and justice and peace and compassion. Tiberius the self-proclaimed divine ruler of the empire. You can still see his arch in Rome with its depiction of the soldiers plundering the Jerusalem temple, carrying away a nation's hope for freedom. And then there's Pontius Pilate able to sentence Jesus to death for the sake of expediency and false peace. There's the Herod family co-joined to Roman power and brutal to any opposition. Lysanias, well, he's a bit of a mystery, but his Greek background, his family's connections to Cleopatra, indicated that his family was at the heart of the political and military intrigue that, that so often brought suffering to the population. And then there's Annas and Caiaphas, high priests from the ruling classes. They had a stake in keeping the peace with the oppressor and willing, they were willing to sell out any voice that gave hope to those who, who lived on the margins. Without exception, you see, these rulers stood in the way and the way Luke lists them one by one by one, it's a kind of literary drumbeat that makes us understand that the world so often stands against the goodness and good news of the gospel. Now we know that this is the third time in Luke's gospel that he locates the good news drama amid the major actors on the world stage. The first time was, was the birth of John the Baptist when he says in the days of King Herod of Judah. And next is the birth of Jesus that takes place under the rule of Emperor Augustus while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And now, once again, as John is about to start his ministry, Luke again places his story amid historical figures. And so it just begs the question, why does he do this? If I was to offer a guess, I would say that it's because Luke has guts. That is, he makes bold to say that these events, about as small and insignificant as you can imagine, that they deserve to be placed alongside the world-shaking people and events of human history. It's as if Luke dares his readers to ask, what is the birth of two small children or the ministry of a misplaced prophet have to do with kings and emperors and governors? And Luke's reply, it has everything to do with it, which is the way it is with the gospel. It seems so small that it's easy to miss. And more than that, God's mercy comes disguised as human weakness. Two vulnerable children who will grow up to change the world. An instrument of Roman torture turned into the means by which God reconciles the world unto God's own self. 
there is always something akin to the mustard seed about the gospel. It creeps in unaware, small and insignificant until it grows and grows and spreads, infesting whole fields and inviting all kinds of creatures to take refuge in its branches. And so Luke begins his story by making the outrageous claim that God is at work in the weak and in the small. Babies and barren women and unwed teenage mothers and wild-eyed prophets and itinerant preachers and executed criminals. God's at work intending to change the world. And to be quite honest, God isn't done yet because God continues to work through unlikely characters today to announce the news of God's redemption. It's a promise, as I said, that's easy to miss. But when we hear it, and even more, when we see it taking place in our own lives, then it changes us along with the world. By this time in December, the darkness of night claims more hours than the sun. It's dark when the alarm goes off in the morning, and it's dark before most any of us get home at night. In December, you see, life is framed by darkness. And so maybe that's why we notice this listing of rulers in this reading. Maybe it's the darkness in Advent that makes us take seriously all the barriers that stand in the way of good news flowing to, to each and every person. Our cries for the coming of Jesus come from our deep awareness that there's still so much that seems to stand in the way, so many barriers that seem to stretch out before us. And sometimes all we can do is count them one by one while we stand stuck in life unsure how to take the next step forward. Well, clearly Luke understands this darkness. And yet his desire was not to lead his listeners into despair, but rather to announce to them that not one of those barriers would keep God's word from coming. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness, in a tiny faithful family on the edge of the empire in the wilderness. There is nothing less than the word of God, the breath of life, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, to most in the world, it might not seem like much. But to us, we see in the flicker of this, in this tiny flicker, the word of God, the presence of the spirit coming to us in, in real time, in our historical time. We see the view of a future set before us that is filled with forgiveness and peace and reconciliation and indeed love. And just over our shoulders are our fellow pilgrims on this journey. There's a community of love, each of whom is, who has seen this light and heard this voice speaking in the wilderness, a community that's walking with us, each in their own way, preparing the way of the Lord. And as it turns out, you and I, we don't have to hold on for dear life because the life of the coming one is already holding on to us. I know it's just under three weeks before Christmas. I know that there's so much that stands between this day and that night. There'll be shopping and decorating, stress and family, wrapping and baking, joy and glad and sadness. There will be even shorter days than today. There will be Caesar Augustus and Quirinius. There'll be a long and crooked road from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But people of God, nothing can stop this birth. The child is coming and we will be carried to the other side, to Bethlehem and to Easter and to that moment when all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Amen. With one another, we profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we await the coming of Christ, we pray and hope for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Prepare your church to share the good news, life-giving God. Put your word within us and dwell among us. Send us out to proclaim the mercy and salvation that abides in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Protect your creation, life-giving God. Sustain the mountains and hills. Restore rivers. Give us wisdom and compassion to care for wilderness areas and urban ecosystems. Move us to care for your creation in all its forms and in all its richness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Purify the hearts of all people, life-giving God. Remove the hate that lives within us and among us. Mold us into peacemakers. Raise up leaders rooted in your love and fed by your word. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Comfort all who hurt life-giving God. Wrap them in your tender care. Remember the forgotten and send us out to share your love with them. Be with the wandering, the worried, and the woeful. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bless this congregation, life-giving God. Give strength and joy to worship leaders, musicians, and all who work to make our worship meaningful as they prepare the way for the celebration of the Christ child's coming among us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We remember the generations who have shown us your faithfulness, life-giving God. Shine your light on those who mourn and prepare us for that day when we will see you face to face. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Confident that the Holy Spirit in intercedes for us, we bring to you these prayers and those unspoken. In the name of Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and ever-living God. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes again to judge the world in righteousness. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God, King of glory. You sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the darkness of our world to be a light among us, the light of your love. In weakness he took on our flesh in the form of a child to live and grow as one of us. In weakness and strength he showed forth your love and followed your call, even to death upon a cross for the sake of our sins. Then you raised him from the dead to reign with you in glory and promised his return to us in power to bring us into your everlasting kingdom. For all this we thank you, O God. We live in that hope and await his coming again, raising our voices in fervent prayer. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. 
He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Be with us at our table, O God, in our eating and in our drinking, that the spirit of hope may be kindled in our hearts and in our lives, uniting us in him who came and who will come again, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We do extend an invitation for all to receive the bread and wine of the Lord's table within our public service of worship each Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to us through the sacrament of this Holy Supper. May your presence in our lives give us patience and peace in this holy season and make us eager for your return when you will bring all the faithful into your heavenly kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Congregation of Messiah Lutheran thanks you for joining our worship this day. And we continue to invite you to join us each Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m., either in public worship in our sanctuary at 1106 Yemen's Hall Road or by joining us again for our online liturgy. Few services of worship capture the awe and mystery of God's presence as does the festival service of worship celebrating the nativity of our Lord Christmas Eve. This year our in-person in -person service of worship is offered on December 24th at 5 o'clock p.m and is recorded to air online on Facebook and YouTube at 11 o'clock p.m. We invite you to join us either for public or for online worship, celebrating Christmas with communion and carols and candlelight. And now may God be with you as you keep watch for the one whose advent is promised. Amen. May God embolden your witness to Christ's coming and so prepare his way. Amen. May you be found ready and alert at Christ's return, at peace in body, mind, and spirit, and doing his will. Amen. And may God Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. And now may God's people go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.